This exercise is all about final sub-circuit design. This particular installation is a single phase house that's been wired using TPS cable and it has a list of the loads within the installation. We have to allocate the circuit number, the purpose, the protective device rating, what size cable cross-sectional area will have and the number of points. For this exercise we're going to use our basic electrical knowledge to determine both the cross-sectional area and the protective device rating. Let's begin with the 22 light points. Circuit number one will be a light circuit. The cross-sectional area for the cable I've decided to use a 1.5 millimeter squared. You could use one square millimeter cable for a lighting circuit. However, I've decided to go with 1.5 square millimeter. Now that we've determined our cable size, we need to work out what size protective device rating we'll have. For this, we're going to refer to table C6. Table C6 is a simplified protective device selection for cables from 1mm through to 25mm squared. This is for single phase installations. In no way is this an exhausting list of the current carrying capacities of cables. And we'll do some work with ASNZS 3008, which is much more detailed to determine current carrying capacity. In our exercise, our lighting circuit is installed clipped to timbers in the roof. So we'll look down for a 1.5 millimeter squared cable and we'll go across and see which one best suits the description of clipped to timbers in the roof. The first three columns are unenclosed. The other two columns talk about enclosed, enclosed in a wiring enclosure. We are just clipped directly to the timbers. So the most appropriate one for us would probably be in air. I'm going to derate it and I'm going to allow for installation of thermal insulation later on. So I'm actually going to suggest that 10 amps would be appropriate. Next, I'm going to refer to table C9 to see how many points I can put on a circuit. Table C9 provides guidance on the loading of final sub-circuits and for a 1.5 millimeter square cable with a 10 amp circuit breaker, each lighting point will contribute 0.5 of an amp towards a total. Therefore I can put a total of 20 lighting points on each circuit. As my installation has got 22 lights, it'll exceed it. It's my preference from a design point of view to have two lighting circuits as opposed to one lighting circuit. It's I'm going to actually allocate circuit 1 and 2 to lights with 10 amp breakers with 11 lighting points each. Now one could argue that that's a little bit conservative and perhaps you could get away with using a 1mm cable and rating that 1mm cable at 16 amps and getting away with everything on one circuit. That's a choice that you can make. For our next circuit, we're going to look at 24 double 10 amp socket outlets with wiring installed at clip to timbers in the roof. The minimum size conductor to supply socket outlets is 2.5mm squared, generally speaking. So I've allocated that circuit through will be power with 2.5 millimeter square conductor. Once again, using table C6, I'll now look at what the appropriate size circuit break will be for a 2.5 millimeter squared conductor clipped to timbers in the roof. Consulting table C6, I said the 2.5 millimeter square conductor installed in air is good for 25 amps. Moving across, I see that partially surrounded in thermal insulation would be good for 20, in thermal insulation completely surrounded would be good for 16. We earlier stated that it may be prudent to design in such a way that thermal insulation might be installed in the roof. In this example, I'm actually gonna use 20 amps as a protective device. Now that I've set my power circuit, we'll be running 2.5 millimeter square conductor protected by a 20 amp breaker. I'll have a look at the number of points that I can put on there. I'll now refer to table C9. On table C9, I'll work my way down the side and look for a 2.5 millimeter square conductor with a 20 amp circuit breaker. I'll then come across to have a look at what 10 amp single phase or multi-phase socket outlets contribute. And in this example, I'm in a domestic installation. So when I have a look down, I said that it's one amp. That's one amp per point. This particular installation has got 24 doubles. Now there is a footnote here that we've covered off on earlier. Footnote 3 is what we need to draw our attention to. Let's check that out. Footnote 3 says that for the purpose of determining the number of points, a modal combination of socket outlets is regarded as the same number of points. Therefore, 
we have a double outlet, it's actually worth two points. So 24 doubles are actually worth 48 points. And those 48 points contribute one amp each. So that's a total of 48 amps. Now we said earlier we were going to use a 20 amp breaker. So we'll have to take our 48 amps and divide it by 20. It'll give us two with the remainder. So therefore three circuits. I did 16 points for each of these circuits. And I'll protect it with a 20 amp breaker. I argue that a 16 amp break would be sufficient. Once again, the circuit breaker is there to protect the cable. As far as what hangs off the end of it, the installing electrician won't have much say over. So as long as we as the installing electrician can design it in such a way that we meet the criteria of reliable operation and to reduce inconvenience in the event of a fault, we've done our job. I'm happy with this design. Let's move on to the next one. We've got a six kilowatt cooktop with wiring installed clipped to timbers under the floor. Our reference for the cooktop will be table C5. Table C5 provides guidance on domestic cooking appliances and is, a, and is an extension of clause C2.5.3. Note on table C5, it says that a domestic cooking appliance greater than five kilowatts but not greater than eight kilowatts would have an assessed maximum demand of 20 amps. Now we'll consult table C6 to see what cable can be protected by a 20 amp circuit breaker when the cables are clipped under the floor. So once again I'll have a look in the unenclosed columns and my way, make my way down and when I look in air I could get away with 1.5 millimeter square sort of be I would think it would be prudent to go a little bit bigger than that so I'm going to consider my cable to be installed partially surrounded in thermal insulation and I'm going to now allocate a 2.5 millimeter square cable for that circuit. Our next circuit is the wall oven. Go to table C5 to see what the assessed maximum demand is. Table C5 says that anything that's not greater than 5,000 watts will have an assessed maximum demand of 16 amps. Where we have a look for 16 amps unenclosed, we could certainly get away with a 1.5 millimeter square conductor. The next circuit in question is a storage hot water system. This is a 4.4 kilowatt unit. Once we've got our maximum demand of 19.1 amps, we then need to select a protection device. And it needs to be either equal to or greater than the maximum demand. In this case, it'll be 20 amps. I've already populated the number of points on this one because there's only one. So now I'm gonna go back and consult table C6 and find a cable that, when installed, enclosed in conduit in air, will be able to carry 20 amps. The second last column on table C6 talks about enclosed situations and installed in air. I'm looking for 20 amps, 2.5 millimeter squared is a minimum size conductor. The last circuit, which I did overlook previously, is a 15 amp socket outlet for a split system air conditioner. The wiring installed is clipped to timbers in the roof. The socket outlet has got a specific task and that is to run that split system air conditioner. It's a 15 amp maximum demand Therefore, I'm going to allocate a 16 amp circuit breaker. Now I'll go back to consult table C6 again. For the appropriate size conductor, I'm satisfied that the minimum size would be 1.5 millimeter squared. So there's my final design for this particular exercise. The minor variations that you could get away with. As I said earlier, maybe you prefer to do one lighting circuit. Perhaps I could choose to reduce my number of power circuits by increasing the circuit breaker depending on the amount of risk I'm prepared to run. I'm satisfied with the way I've done this. That this will be a reliable installation, minimise any inconvenience in the event of a fault.